Okay, how about so, you? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's actually from batch two. Then, let me Thank you all. So just to use the time efficiently, I'll just uh, dive into the topic that we will be covering today. So I hope all of you have some know-how about A-B testing and hypothesis testing. That's very crucial in today's machine learning activity and also uh, in, in every industry just to make sure uh, we are doing something at the statistically significant level. So hypothesis testing is very important stuff. So I will be highlighting a uh, couple of ideas in the sequential daily testing today. Then we'll uh, give you last five to 10 minutes for QA stuff so that you can ask some questions and I will reply on that. Sure. Awesome. So, yeah, just as a refresher, so let's start with some um, conversations. So, who can talk a few words about any testing? But if I make it open for all of you, so you can. So what's A-B testing? What do you know about A-B testing? Or hypothesis testing as well? Wait, not me. A-B testing is the way to parent variants of some of them that are set, but some different in some aspects. If you are like, you just test for two variants. That you, so for example, for a website, so we are checking the click ratio. The click ratio. So for example, let's say for data set A. You have a higher ratio, and you have a, a lower ratio. So we just test uh, our hypothesis in that. Our null hypothesis would be, uh, no, we don't have uh, a higher click ratio in in data set. Right? So our our controlling hypothesis would be, yes, we have uh, a higher click ratio. So that's why. Okay, thanks. Anyone who wanted to add? Okay, just yeah, hello. Uh, we use it in order to test the difference between uh, groups of people, of people in, in two groups, uh, in order to find out which one of them, uh, of, uh, which one of them, I think that point yeah. So, for example, <laughs> Uh, I can have a control group and an experiment group, and then I would like to get the difference between the two groups. Yeah. Good work. So, I think you already said that. Your audio, your audio I, is really quite uh, distorted. I think it's not only for me. Is that is is Ababa's audio okay, Alastasia, from your side? Uh, not not my part. Oh, okay. Maybe let me let me change my. Yeah. One second. One
Okay, so can you hear me now? Much better. It's good. It's good. Yes. Okay. So let me share my screen and look all this. So yeah, I mean, like I, I will cover some of the uh, topics in the next slides, but I'll just jump into uh, some more questions around it. Again, around the uh, uh, common terms such as null and alternative hypothesis. What's your understanding about null and alternative hypothesis? Just again from the attendees. Anyone other than Nathaniel? I think just to make sure all of us are participating. Nice, Fasha. Yeah, so hi, thank you. Uh, I think the null hypothesis is the one that says there will be no difference whether or not we do this, uh, this other, uh, <laughs> this, uh, the muting. Uh, you know, it says there will be no difference whether or not we do this new thing. That's the null hypothesis. Well, the alternative hypothesis uh, states that there will be a difference in the thing or the new thing we are trying to do. Basically, I think that's the whole concept. Yeah. Anyone who wanted to add? Yeah. So as you said, Okay, and the next? Basically, null hypotheses are like a hypothesis that uh, negates the alternative hypothesis, which means, as the name indicates, just nullifies it. Which means, like, if we're, uh, if our like base hypothesis is that this thing, the new thing, will have this kind of impact on uh, the current thing, the null hypothesis just negate that, saying it will not impact whatsoever. Yeah, good one. So yeah, overall, when we, is that different stuff, just yes? Yes, uh, I think that the new hypothesis is, is formulated based on the expectation of, of the company or of the work. For example, uh, I, I'm saying this because I, I think that it's not only in the case that we would like to show that there is no difference. We, we, for example, we can be in the case when the company wants maybe uh, a performance which is which is I mean uh, lower or greater than the trust a given trust code. Then we can say that our our new hypothesis it can be that uh, the metric is less than the trust code and the, uh, the alternative hypothesis is definitely the negative or the opposite of the new hypothesis. Yeah. So I think all of you said uh, correcting, but the main point is how to set that null and alternative hypothesis. So usually we start with uh, understanding the general truth. So let's say, uh, we wanted to test the new uh, change that we applied into the uh, we can use the same scenario that uh, Nathaniel mentioned earlier to design a website let's say if uh, we applied some change it could be color or text to the website so naturally when you apply the change you think from that change will bring uh, better user attention so that will be your initial null hypothesis, something that's general truth in every aspect, then like the, your hypothesis will be the color change will uh, bring like increase on the user engagement than the existing old setup. So you start with that, then uh, you set another opposite hypothesis that is aimed to disqualify could be there is no change, the two variants are similar or 
the change is coming from like it's not actually to say uh, like when you uh, after you after you set up that nela hypothesis if you come up with some decision it's not to mean the decision that you uh, come up with is to uh, reject the other side or that is the change is not completely coming from variant a rather it is you are statistically uh, like finding some confidence level to say yes the change is really coming from the variant a and uh, you are also like proving some statistical significant point to say there is no change at all the two variants are similar so it's not to mean accepting one hypothesis is not to mean like in the real world is completely rejecting the other uh, product or the other variant it's just to show the data it's showing some statistical level of confidence to say the change is really coming from a or the change is really coming from the end there is no difference so it's all about uh, checking checking the initial hypothesis we have so the process is to prove that but the nl hypothesis usually favors for the general truth that we have the, uh, we usually start with or some general truth about the thing that we wanted to test so hope that's clear so again there are some uh, important points uh, like the type one and the type two era usually alpha and the beta so anyone who wanted to interact on this Okay, allow did you see us? Yeah, uh, I think the type one error is the probability of rejecting the new hypothesis when it is actually true. The type one error is the probability of rejecting the new hypothesis when it is true. And the type two error is the, the probability of uh, 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 asserting the new hypothesis. They, no, the alternative hypothesis when the make hypothesis is true. Yeah, generally it's between the false positive and false negative. With the type one error, we are measuring the false positive. That's actually the error rate to say uh, the null hypothesis is wrong while it's true. And the other uh, type two is the reverse one. So. So I think given that we have this uh, initial concept and overall the A-B testing idea and the terminologies, so I can deprive him to uh, today's topic. So let's take this scenario. So we have two variants and both of them have 50 visitors. So from variant A, we are seeing 25% conversion and from Variant B, we are seeing 70% conversion. Let's say conversion could be um, viability rate, number of users uh, seeing the page. If the objective is to bring the user, or let's say if it's e commerce sites, so we are trying to measure maybe number of people who complete the uh, purchasing process, or could be the number of products sold so you may have different metrics to uh, determine your conver conversion rate but let's say 50 percent of the visitors uh, that we distributed the same variant for the same user like and from 50 percent of users who already seen this variant a we have 25 percent conversion from 50 percent so uh, like variant B, we are having 70%. So the idea now with the A-B testing is, so the null hypothesis could be, yes, really the change we made to variant B for the website B is bringing change, that is 70% conversion. This, this is the null hypothesis, the initial null hypothesis. Then we are aimed to prove that, yes, it's coming from the change that we uh, apply to uh, variant B or it's not the change is not coming from those changes that's the main aim behind uh, 
applying a b testing usually in the uh, real world scenario so in the uh, like classic classical way of applying a b testing usually we need some uh, sample data that allow us to get the significant uh, decision to make to say that the uh, null hypothesis is true or uh, false but the problem is so like in the real industry so we can't get the data that's already preset or collected and uh, stored somewhere to do that test so we need to collect that data regularly while the two variants are already running this change, this need of collecting data, like bring another cost related uh, issue in the industry while we apply the, uh, like the conventional or classic A-B testing idea. So this is actually uh, like the truth of the uh, cost that usually uh, we may see while applying that classical A-B testing or at the phase of data collection. So we can't easily get that significant level of decision having that small set of data because with a classical A-B testing or the regular A-B testing way that we really do, we need to predetermine we have enough sample size before doing that test. So to get that sample test or sample data, we may wait for months, two months, three months. So on average, this is actually the statistics from different company that uh, how long it took to uh, reach to that initial sample size. So it depends on the companies and the streaming data size. But still, uh, to reach that big customer, we may either distribute in a different channel or we need to run it for the longer period. So that brings the issue of uh, like running out of the cost or the budget at the phase of data collection before uh, getting into the uh, expected result. So this is where the need of sequential testing idea comes. Two cost issues uh, are uh, can be uh, taken into account at this as this space. One is the actual data collection cost because of the lengthy, uh, the, like. Uh, long duration, waiting duration to get that like predetermined sample size, and also the opportunity cost of waiting for an experiment. So industry is all about money. We can't just wait while uh, the data collection steps running. You can't, as a data scientist, you can't say the company or that person. So I don't have the enough data currently i can't say the decision so just wait there are a lot of issues factors that are associated to that because of the opportunity because of the competition in the uh, business itself so what's the idea of sequential testing then so we know that with a classical way of doing a b testing we can't get uh, into the final decision without having that enough size data so it needs uh, it brings the cost stuff so the idea of sequential testing here is, can we do a test like sequentially when the new data is available? So this, uh, with this idea in 1945, there is the uh, like world proposed actually nice idea that allow us to uh, run some experiment on whenever there is new data uh, point, we can do either tied, that is actually, that looks for the historical data uh, connection and also the current experiment and the control group relationship, or just only looking for the two pair of data, slicing data in a group. Whenever we have data, we may run some conditional test sequentially and compare to get that whether the current data, the sequentially coming data can give us the uh, significant result or not. So to do this, we need to fit three conditions actually. That is 
the data collection is terminated. That's the main problem of the early, uh, the classical solution that we are uh, using. The data collection can be terminated because of enough evidence has been collected for the null hypothesis to say either accept it or reject it. And also the data collection is terminated because of enough evidence has been collected for the alternative hypothesis. So in either way, either to reject or to decide if we the data that we are collecting is enough, we can stop the uh, execution. But whenever we have the new data points up, uh, like coming, we can do the test. That may depend on the objective we have. We may either sequentially test it whenever we have new data point, or we may do some scheduled test by using some uh, pre-analysis that we know how the data stream is coming, we know the size, we can just infer how that can affect the uh, experimentation that we're gonna do. So based on that, we can set some condition and do sequentially testing it. Then if we don't have, like while doing that test, if we can't able to reach into the decision, having that all data, we can keep the uh, testing in progress or just by saying the continue testing stuff. So this is the idea of sequential testing. Whenever you have the data, uh, the newly available data, so you do the test either by only taking the new segment or just doing the tide or that, that consider the conditional relationship to the historical data we have. So in Sequential A-B testing, the main point is actually the testing stop as soon as we observe the uh, expected result. That is statistically significant result to say either reject the null hypothesis or accept the alternative hypothesis. So if we observe more extreme result as a start, then the test can be ended earlier. To achieve this, we need to do some uh, statistical borders. So. Uh, Sorry, I think if there is background noise. So can you hear me just to confirm? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so yes, the idea can. is so at the public space, that's why, sorry for that. Uh, meanwhile, I think I can just wait for that. Okay, I think this is now better. So here is the plan to do so. So what we do, we draw the uh, data border that's actually uh, some condition that allow us to say this result uh, like accepting the null hypothesis or rejecting the null hypothesis to do so we draw some uh, border lines and we apply the experiment that's actually the probability of accepting or rejecting the uh, given hypothesis and try to uh, like if that test is actually the experiment we do is keep lying in between the two drawn border, it's to mean we are just in need of more data. So keep uh, like doing that the same test again and again, or I keep collecting data and run the test in the next condition uh, that we orchestrated. If it lies or if it starts to the, the upper border that we designed, that's in favor of null hypothesis. If it is touching to the lower border that we designed, we draw that's that designing or drawing that border also needs some uh, competition will come to that point. So it's to, we are like concluding in the favor of alternative hypothesis as a whole. So for sequential uh, testing, generally we have two variants. There are a lot of uh, actually techniques to achieve this. We may see different algorithms here and there, but overall these two can be uh, uh, taken as a variant of sequential testing as uh, they are very popular. 
So one and very popular and easy to do kind of sequential testing algorithm is the Wallis sequential probability ratio test that is usually called as sequential t-test. So the idea here is we try to uh, like transform the sequence of observations that we take and we try to uh, find the relationship between the two that is actually the log like likelihood of uh, the success rate to the experiment and the uh, control group we have and we are just only comparing the pairs that we are picking not looking into the tied relationship between the pair that is the conditional relationship and also how the two data points are related from previous historical data we have and the uh, like contextual relationship between the data is missed while we do this kind of testing usually this kind of testing is uh, used for normally distributed kind of data uh, because of the need for predefined uh, variance while doing that hypothesis but we have another conditional probability ratio test that help us to get both the uh, like that can work on binomial or poison distribution and also the uh, like help us to get the tide or the mutual kind of observation and like relation between the two pair of inputs that we are pick picking when doing the test so the idea is the same in the walls and the conditional superiority the only uh, like opportunity that we get here is we solve the limitation of normally uh, like the reliance on the nor normally distributed data for the wireless superiority and also the uh, only the like the ignorance of that tide observation that we usually you need to compute while we do like two binomial proportions so because because of the nature of data that we usually do we may have both the uh, experiment and the control group may create different binomial proportion so we can do the competition in between two different data points by taking the two pair with a conditional superiority whereas with the one this we need to convert that two different data points into one binomial group and only see the difference between the data points but that's not always true because we are not always seeing that normalized data distribution in the real uh, time problem. So what's the SAPRT is the question here. So as I said, traditionally we were just limited into some fixed data size, but now we are getting advantage of sequential test. So to run the test, whenever we have the data available, we choose an item randomly from the two group, do hypothesis test, and if we reach to the conclusion, we early uh, stop the testing and the data collection is that. And if you are not- uh, I'm sorry, uh, well, sorry to interrupt. If you are sharing your slide, we can't see your slide. We are just seeing the gym Yeah. That's bad. So what about now? Uh, we, we can see your screen, but you are on the Jimmy top. Let me move into another one. Yeah, definitely. I will share all the documents. Sorry for that. I think I thought you were seeing it 
and I was talking too much. Can you see it now? Yes, we can now see it. Sure, I, I will share all the documents I have uh, later on. Yeah, so this is actually the thing that I was mentioning. Uh, so I will give you a chance to ask questions later just to make sure uh, you never miss the points I wanted to touch. So as the idea clear in between the, on the difference of ones and the conditional probability ratio test. Is that clear? Uh, means not clear. So, yeah, let me repeat. So, both of the variants are actually created to compute the sequential testing over the uh, sequentially streaming data. But the main difference here is with the wild sequential probability ratio test, the aim is actually to get. Uh, we are looking for relationship between two variants in a normalized, uh, in normally distributed kind of data. That's otherwise uh, not something we can easily get in the real industry. The distribution may, could be binomial or could be poison. So with the wild uh, superiority, we need to convert that two variants, the experiment and control group we have into one binomial distribution regularly and compute the pair of uh, like kind of pair by uh, we'll pick different pair that could be a group from the data and compute the log likelihood ratio between the two pair of points that we randomly picked from the data and because of that uh, normally distributed data reliance we need to also predefine the variance uh, before doing that hypothesis testing with a wildest approach, that's the sequential t-test. So here we are trying to transform the sequence of observation into sequence of t-statistical findings. That's actually the dependent variance observation to independent of the variance we have that we initially preset. But with a conditional uh, sequential probability test, the aim is not just to find the uh, independency of to the variance, rather we are trying to find the uh, tied relationship between the two data group. So we just need the two uh, data inputs, the control and experiment group. Then we uh, compute, we pick one point from both of the data points, do the likelihood ratio. That is actually the conditional probability. So from your uh, language uh, modeling task, usually if we wanted to model the uh, text as the sequential input to represent word in the third order, you need to represent the historical words too. That's actually how you uh, conditionally infer the probability of the current input given the historical data. The same idea is applied here with the conditional uh, sequential probability ratio test. We are trying to do the tied relationship between the historical data and the, the current observation that we picked while keeping the mutual uh, like kind of that tied observation uh, relationship between the two data points that uh, we picked. So it can be applied for any kind of distribution, not limited to the uh, normal distribution uh, data point and no need to predefine the initial variance other than the common errors, the ex expected type one, type two, uh, type one and type two errors. So, but from the both approach, from the both variant that I mentioned, we have the term called sequential probability ratio test. So what's the idea there? So it's, it's pretty much straightforward. So with the sequential probability ratio test, what we are trying to do, we take the sequentially coming data point, choose randomly choose a few, uh, could be like, an item or something that happened in a scheduled, some defined time uh, period. So we do the testing that is actually the uh, likelihood 
or the probability of getting success chance given the two observation that we randomly picked at that given time we do that probability test so if uh, the upper and lower boundary that we defined is uh, closer to that uh, like if the point that we determine the likelihood ratio is in between that two upper and lower bound we continue the testing that is to mean actually we are in need of new data point and we continue sampling and doing the test if it is touching to the uh, lower border let me show this with some graphs like this is actually the easiest way to say it so we need to draw this line actually to say uh, like a kind of rejection null hypothesis rejection line and also null hypothesis acceptance acceptance kind of line so this working kind of uh, point that's shown in this graphs actually the likelihood ratio that we are computing experimenting the idea here is to find can it actually like touch the drawn borders we have so if it is passing this the bottom uh, boundary that is the lower boundary with design we are actually accepting the null hypothesis at that point if it is in between the two uh, boundaries we have we are in need of the uh, more sampling and the more data but when we have more and the more data we know that the size or the borders are shrinking together and at some point they become very closer when we have the rich data point so that is where the you comes the final decision that the two variants are completely the same so uh, uh, yeah this is the main point here we we have the two hypotheses the null and alter, of the alternative hypothesis so we need to determine this theta that's actually the model parameters the, that we estimate at the time of learning then what SPRT does is actually tries to find uh, the uh, given the uh, data points we have and the hypothesis we wanted to test so we are uh, trying to determine the probability that's the likelihood for the uh, alternative hypothesis and also the uh, null hypothesis at the same time then we take the ratio that is the uh, actually the ratio of likelihood alternative hypothesis to the likelihood of null hypothesis as the m step that m actually points to the data point that we are currently picking to do the test the real test so we keep doing that test uh, and we in in every step in every test we need to check this condition actually while initially define these uh, three conditions to either reject or accept the hypothesis we have or to keep doing the continued sampling so once we have that uh, lr then we need to test the uh, b actually that is the the beta and uh, if it is in between these two value then that's actually like a and the b are kind of uh, the rules that we depend on uh, like we depend to determine the final decision we have to say uh, like accept or reject so a is computed as uh, 1 minus beta over alpha and b is computed as beta over 1 minus alpha so this is the defined rule we uh, do the lr that is the log likelihood conditional log likelihood in the case of conditional SPRT and just in the wildest SPRT is just like uh, like the log likelihood then we do the ratio that's the uh, log likelihood ratio of alternative or log likelihood ratio of the null hypothesis we have we try to check that with the uh, predefined like conditions we have because alpha and the beta are predefined so there is like globally uh noun truths uh, kind of values or you can come up with some uh, like if you are rea realistic enough to the values that we are finding for the beta and the alpha you can uh, like pick that value earlier and put it but globally they accept the kind of specification for the alpha we usually wanted to keep 
uh, 0.05. That's actually we are uh, trying to uh, like accept if the area is like less than five kind of. So we, are, we wanted to keep 95% of confidence level at this point, having the 0.05 alpha means. That's the type one error. And for the type two error, we usually uh, look for 20 or less value. So if you like, if you are, uh, you, you can come up with some already like kind of realistic value with some tuning stuff that you can come up with. Yes, you can change the values, but you have to make sure you know what you are doing when you try to do that uh, testing at all. But overall 95% uh, testing is acceptable and it may depend on uh, different domain that we are applying in some uh, domain we wanted to minimize that precision too it may be like uh, we may want to keep 95 98 percent kind of accuracy for the type one error that's actually to say the uh, null hypothesis is uh, wrong while it is true so it's just checking this rule and uh, keep doing the test again and again till we get to the final decision we have. So yeah, that's, that's the idea. Uh, but the same idea is happening with the conditional SPRT. So I, I actually attached this reference original paper here. It's well uh, actually documented, detailed kind of paper. You can easily understand the motivation behind the conditional SPRT idea over the world's idea and all the variables, how things are computed there with this from this uh, reference. So with this, what the idea is, uh, it's about computing the conditional log like the uh, hood ratio, not just the LR. With the conditional, I mean, we are inferring for the uh, previous data we have and trying to find the current uh, log likelihood given the historical data point we have to. And also, uh, it's not, uh, it's actually not uh, converting the data point we have into one uh, like normal distribution. So as I said, with the wildest approach, we need to convert the two data frames we have, uh, or like the control and experiment group data we have into single dis uh, data uh, kind of series, so that we only compute uh, the relation between one, uh, pair that we are picking. But in this case, we need to keep the two uh, data points separated. We can pick, randomly pick, choose the, uh, could it be one item or a group of items from that control and experiment group. We do the conditional uh, like log likelihood ratio test given the historical data we have and uh, check the same condition that we did for the previous one. But in this case, we have different formula to uh, find the, like the CL, that's actually the uh, like lower boundary and the CU, that's actually the upper boundary. N is the observation that we are. Some of all the points we have. That's why actually I say the conditional thing. So we are keeping the data, uh, historical data relationship into the current data points that we are currently getting so yeah so you will get what it means of each function we have this f actually that's the main function that we are looking for in the, this original paper is well detailed there i will gonna uh, skip this part and maybe we will come back if you have further questions uh, like since we are uh, running out of the time i will gonna skip that for you but the idea with the sequential testing is while the data is coming, doing the test again and again. But one question that may come to your mind is, what makes it different if we are just uh, uh, keep doing that, uh, uh, like sampling the stuff, if the, the log likelihood ratio or the experiment value that we find this lies in the two boundaries forever, like if it, in that way, when to stop the experiments, the main question, right? So for that particular scenario, with a conditional SPRT, so there is the concept of uh, test truncation. So we can tran truncate the test in favor of uh, closeness. So if the 
the like the ratio that we found actually the lr is closer to the uh, lower boundary we can close by saying that uh, like like uh, it's in this percent or in this uh, kind of percent closer to this uh, like it's not at this point it's not statistically significant to say we are accepting the null hypothesis but it's closer in this percent to the uh, null hypothesis and we can point that point when we come up to that decision that is actually the data point that helped us to get that decision and that uh, we can uh, stop the testing with uh, forced truncation rule. So it's a kind of forced kind of stopping, but the conclusion is uh, something that is closer to the closeness between the LR value we found and the uh, points we have, that's the upper and the lower boundary. So uh, it's a kind of old code, uh, not the latest one. So it was, uh, uh, let me open this one maybe, I don't know, it's two years or one year ago, I implemented uh, uh, the, this book that I attached here. So uh, what I wanna uh, do here is, I hope you already have the data, this ad recall data. So since you already started working on applying A-B testing and ML machine learning uh, based solution to solve this problem, I'm gonna also request you to deal with this data. So you have success, that is the engagement one. You have failure, that is engagement zero, that's no and yes for all the auction value we have. So apply the conditional SPRT. So I tried to include uh, um, like detailed kind of uh, comment for all the variables that I used and align that with the functions. Those are actually uh, available on the uh, paper or the book that I attached here. So if you go through uh, each function, so you can easily understand what it means and how it's computed and you can read it from the paper and you can refer the code here. Uh, it's just kind of uh, hard coded stuff, not well written. So try to come up with something that can uh, beat this uh, function defined here. But what it does is it takes the series of inputs here. We have it converted into two uh, data frame with the binomial series and apply the conditional probability test over that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's how it does, but just to take you through the code. So how it's uh, applied actually. So first we need to convert the data into kind of uh, binomial representation, uh, like binomial distribution, while one that indicates for yes is randomly distributed or, over the data and once you have that prepared data, you can do three steps. The first thing is setting that statistical parameter, alpha, beta, and odd ratio. So uh, uh, alpha is actually the uh, type one error, beta is the type two error. The odd ratio is actually the difference. So you can start with, uh, let's say 1.2 uh, difference, something that you are expecting uh, like 20% difference over the other uh, variant you have. So you can test by giving that, but don't give one for the odd ratio because when you, when you put one, you are uh, saying that, so I don't, uh, I'm just looking for whether the two variants are equal or not. It's just looking for their, uh, their equivalence, not the difference, or it can't help you to see whether the change is coming from the variant A or variant B. So then you need to calculate the lower and upper uh, critical values. Those are the boundaries that you need to draw. Then for you pick uh, like trial. That's actually the random uh, choice that you get from the distribution, the data distribution you have. And you need to apply this log likelihood ratio formula. Then uh, once you have that value, you have this CL and the CU, that's the upper and lower limit you have, 
and you have the LR value, that's the computed log like B ratio, then the idea is just doing the condition check. The, the initial words uh, conditions that help us to either reject or accept any hypothesis. So yeah, if it is like the probability that you determined is above or equal to the upper critical limit, that means you are rejecting the uh, in the favor of alternative hypothesis, rejecting the hypothesis. While uh, whereas if it uh, is less than or is equal to lower critical mean, limit, that means it passes that cross that uh, lower boundary that we don't, then you are actually accepting the null hypothesis you have. Then if it lies in between, then that's actually to mean continue testing till you reach into that the truncate value you initially determined. So the truncate value uh, mean the stopping rule that you uh, either uh, predetermine it depending on the some business rule you have. So, so I don't want to test uh, keep testing it in two months period means that can be taken as the uh, stopping rule for you, then you can determine what is that uh, two months period according to your data. Once your distribution is set, you can find where that point is. So when you reach to that point, you can forcefully stop, stop your uh, decision in favor of closeness, as I said. So you are at that point, you are looking for which line is closer for the last log ratio value that you determined. So, yeah, this is actually, this step is all implemented in the uh, algorithm that I attached here. So I hope you will be going through all the functions we have. Uh, when I share this document, I will also share the Google uh, Collab that I was uh, showing you earlier, this document. It's the plain Python implementation for the uh, steps defined here. So, yeah, I think, I hope you are already familiar with this data point, so I'm not gonna go in detail uh, further uh, about this point. So, this is all uh, kind of, uh, just kind, you can think of as a, not, not as a tutorial, full tutorial, kind of pitching to uh, look into sequential testing over the, uh, classical algorithms that we really use uh, just to get advantage of having early decision uh, and test it and let me know uh, whether you can come up with some nice implementation of the initial draft code that I have shared with you or not. Thank you for the attention. So it's time to question and answer. Yes, this is. Yes, uh, I, would, I would like to thank you for your presentation. It was very nice and very clear. And hopefully, I hope that we will get the, the slides soon in order to be able to go through. But I would like to discuss with you about the the plots that you present when you where you draw you, you draw the boundaries. Uh, it's like you said that uh, if we have more data, uh, we are we are more likely to accept the new hypothesis. And then I, I would like to ask if it is if it is or not for a given significance level. So, uh, so I would like to know if this is this is not especially for a fixed significance level. Yeah, oh, that's that's the Yeah, actually, like it's. Uh... So this. The boundaries actually, the upper and the lower boundaries are computed based on the uh, data we have. If I uh, can show you, uh, I forget to include that, uh, how FT is clearly actually computed here. So if you, uh, you will get actually the uh, exact answer when you look into the 
function f here, how it's determined, how the apparent lower limits are determined, is it dependent on the data points we have. So getting more data means, what does it mean getting more data? First. Uh, it, it, I thought that it's, it means increasing the sample size, right? Increasing, increasing the size of the, the sample. Yeah, I mean, like, we are, sample is actually the uh, data that we use for the experiment, right? Yeah. So we, we can't actually, like, with the sequential tens, don't think of, yeah, if you have advantage of having big data, you may go with some sample size, but it is about getting all the data series you have. That's the idea of testing earlier when the data is available and coming to the early decision. So you have all the data points. That is to mean you are actually like having more and more data means you are seeing the real difference between the two variants because of like different characteristics that you are collecting, right? So yeah. if two points are crossed, uh, that means so like the point that we can easily say we can reject the null hypothesis or accept the null hypothesis is not feasible enough. That is, they are too much uh, like related, and we, you can't say this uh, change is coming easily from the other uh, variant A or variant B. But that was actually what I want to say. So the odd ratio becomes one. It's, it's too close. And they are like kind of similar points. No difference can be easily uh, identified from that. If you understand me clearly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, that, no. That, that, that's not otherwise the case, actually. Uh, usually you may uh, like, I mean, in practice, if the two data points are uh, related and the change is really coming from either of the variant, you can early see the difference. You may either reject it as a, uh, like, uh, usually after 10 to 15 kind of trial you have. That is in each trial, you are taking some sample, the end size, like slice from the data. If you are sliding with some group, not at the pair. Okay. Now, uh, I think that uh, we use the the type one error and the type two error, right? In order to draw the boundaries. Now, yeah. how to, uh, my question is how to choose them, especially a type two error. Uh, you mean the, the initial errors, the one, type one and the type two? Yes, how to choose them. For the type one error, I think that since, since we are able to to calculate the scene kickers level, it is, we can get a type one error. Now, what about the type two error? How to? Yeah, to actually, I uh, I mentioned two values there as a uh, like rule of thumb. So usually, type uh, one is the alpha, that is zero point zero five, like, yeah. and type uh, two is the beta value, that is twenty. So you can just 0 0.2 or less is usually acceptable. And uh, that's actually the suggested value based on multiple uh, experiments in the different domain. But if you, you wanted to test, uh, like if you wanted to reduce your confidence level and if you are realistic enough for the value that you are using, as I said, you may come up with uh, doing some uh, tuning, hyperparameter tuning for this, but otherwise it's uh, recommended to start with 5% tolerance for the type 1 error and 20% uh, tolerance for the type 2 error. Okay. Now, another question is, in this, in, in our challenge, uh, I think that we don't have, uh, I, I think that the the data collection is terminated already, and then we don't have any data collection ongoing. 
So I would like to know if it makes sense to still perform a, a, a sequential test because we don't have any data okay. collection. Let me. Let me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I said that in this week challenge, mm -hmm. we we can notice that the data collection is terminated. Now, my question is: Is does it still make sense to perform a sequential test? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mean you are giving some predefined data, but how to do sequential testing, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So yeah, that's actually the problem. Um, so if you, uh, let me share my screen and just show you how I try to convert it into sequential nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the data point we have is actually uh, with this entry around 8K uh, entries. So like just to test this uh, algorithm, I was trying to convert it into series of or sequentially uh, generated binomial series, uh, bi binomial distribution from the two data points using yes count as a success and no as a failure. So the log likelihood ratio in this case mean you are trying to find the uh, likelihood of saying yes for the given distribution you uh, pick it from the data point. So because you are trying to uh, nullify, so mostly the engagements are coming from variant A or the experiment group. So. Um, I tried to convert that into the, the data distribution to kind of sequential nature, but in, in industry, you can't get this already pre-collected uh, kind of data. You need to do that uh, like while the data is coming with some uh, data pipeline, proper data pipeline. Uh, but for this particular testing, I just uh, bring the data. So it's, it's pretty much easy. You can consider, because we have day and the time here, uh, you can consider the data as a uh, 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 yeah. So, so we have the two control and experiment group. Those are, uh, let's say, X and Y. So this time series data, in the data, if, if you notice, there is date column, right? So you can just convert it into some constant uh, factor. Could it be hourly, daily, based on some impression event or anything else. But here, I, uh, try to aggregate data per hour. So it's hourly aggregate the kind of sequential data. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's all. Okay. Any question? So I think I'm also running out of the time. I have another meeting already past five minutes, but yeah, let me take two or one more question if any of you have. Then what I will do, I'm going to share this two notebook. It's already accessible for anyone. Uh, so, and also uh, share that with Anastasia or Azariadi uh, so that they can reach you. Mm, let me make this one also accessible. Uh, and easily. Here is the slide two. So I will share this uh, same thing for the, all of you so that you can uh, feel free to reach me uh, via my Telegram or anyone else so I can be available to answer your queries. Thank you so much for the uh, patience and 